Great. Okay, we're all set. Go ahead, Tommy. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna share this uh, for a few minutes. So uh, as most of you know, we had our second AstroFest on April 23rd. And uh, of course, uh, it was our first of the pandemic, so we had to adapt. And uh, we were still thrilled to have a good selection of posters presented in the Gather Town uh, interface uh, after the talks. And so we had for the student posters, uh, two judges visit each poster to uh, talk to the presenters and learn about the research. And based on their ratings, we have uh, come up with a set of poster prizes. So I'd like to announce those uh, today. So uh, first in the undergraduate category, uh, we've got uh, uh, Snape Pandia, who uh, won the best undergraduate student poster for a poster called AG, AG Net, <laughs> Weighing Black Holes Using Machine Learning. And so, um, yeah, um, Snake, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Yeah, so if you could just uh, say a few words about your poster. Again, congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank Shin. I know she's here. She's my mentor and she's been guiding me through this the last couple of years. Um, but basically this poster shows our recent work of developing effective machine learning algorithms to estimate the masses of supermassive black holes using light curves from SDSS Stripe 82. Um, this current work falls under machine learning, uh, but we are currently working on a revision to this in which we alter our methodology slightly and are using deep learning techniques. So, um, yeah, thank you, Shin, and as well as my collaborators, Joshua, Devanshi, and Matthias. Um, this was a lot of fun to work on. Okay, terrific. And uh, uh, thank you, Snay. I know you have a class to get to, so <laughs> we'll congratulate you now and uh, let you go. Uh, and uh, in the graduate student category, uh, we have uh, actually a tie. So first, uh, Jennifer Lee, who gave us a poster on the SDSS RM project, Black Hole Scaling Relations at Z less than 0 0.8. Uh, Jennifer, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. So yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about your poster. Yeah, so in this poster, I, uh, I presented our study on the black hole scaling relations on the sample of the uh, SDSS reverberation mapping project. And uh, we found really interesting res uh, uh, results that the black hole scaling relations at redshift under 0 0.8 is similar to the local universe. And we're excited to, um, to work on this and you'll hear more about this in my thesis talk in about a month and a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good Thank luck you. Uh, with this uh, last stretch here. And uh, then the other graduate student that uh, uh, won the poster award is Jesse Miller. Jesse, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, hi Jesse, tell us a little bit about your poster. It's a very uh, large graphic. Yeah, so we know a supernova exploded within about 100 parsecs of the uh, of our solar system three million years ago, and we'd like to see what kind of effect that has on the solar wind. So it seems like for a relatively nearby supernova like this, uh, it could compress the solar wind out, down to 20 AU, which means everything outside of that is directly exposed to the blast of the supernova. Very exciting, maybe a little too close for comfort. Okay, well, thanks so much. Uh, I'll uh, let uh, Yer continue now with the uh, regularly scheduled programming. And yeah, let's give everybody a round of applause for uh, excellent work, uh, especially under such difficult conditions. Congratulations. All right, then, uh, then uh, let's get back to business. Uh, so today, uh, welcome to the last astronomy program of the semester. And we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Uh, Vinnie Howard uh, from University of Louisville um, here today with us. So Dr. Howard got his PhD from University of uh, Groningen in the Netherlands in 2005. Uh, after that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute 
uh, a research fellow at the University of Cape Town, um, the uh, European Space Agency, uh, and then Leiden University. Before he joined the faculty at the Department of Physics and Astronomy uh, at the University of Louisville in 2017. So Dr. Halberta is an expert on the effects of dust on galaxy observations, the evolution of galaxies, including their star formation histories uh, and their physical properties. Uh, and today, he's going to tell us about the details of a particular galaxy, uh, a, a gentle giant spiral galaxy called UGC 2885, uh, but he has nicknamed it the uh, uh, Rubin's Galaxy, and we'll hear more about this uh, particular galaxy. So please go ahead, uh, uh, Lenny. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for uh, for coming to the colloquium because uh, it's uh, it's been a, it's been a year. So I uh, I imagine that everybody is uh, is as tired as my and my students. Um, so uh, this is about one galaxy, which makes me feel uh, a little old school because uh, who talks about just a single galaxy anymore, especially if it's not Andromeda. Um, and so I'll talk about this and I'll talk about it by reasoning why I called it Rubin's Galaxy uh, and why I think it's a gentle giant. Uh, <clears throat> so I did this with a whole bunch of people, um, Rupali Chandar, Pauline Barnby, uh, Savik Ford, Jeremy Balin and Molly Peebles. Uh, we all sort of kind of got the ball rolling on Twitter uh, saying like, hey, this would be interesting. And then, you know, that moved to other means. And then before we knew it, we were, uh, were doing a project basically. And then many, many more people uh, um, uh, piled in, uh, as including all my students that you see in, or students for the projects uh, that are in uh, Italic. Um, and so if you wanna hit me up later, there's my Twitter handle or my uh, email address, feel free to uh, shoot me an email if you, uh, if you like what you see or if you wanna work with me. So the motivation is that massive galaxies have a violent history. At least that's how we understand them. They grow through mergers, they grow through merging with other uh, dark matter halos and then also the galaxies that are in that halo. Uh, and so you'd expect multiple populations of, of stars to live in a galaxy that sometimes have not originated in that galaxy uh, themselves, especially in the stellar halo. That's what I should have written there. The stellar halo is, uh, is populated by galaxy, by stars from galaxies that, uh, other galaxies that have been ripped up by the one that you're looking at. That also is reflected in the globular cluster population. So it, is, it often reflects a uh, patchwork of, um, of, of histories as uh, a lot of the globular clusters were acquired over time. And we're talking about the biggest kind of galaxies, things that are a lot bigger than our Milky Way even. Um, and so, you know, you have to show the video. Um, in, in dark matter, you see the halos, the, the, bigger ha the, the bigger halos that host the bigger galaxies, you see those merge and you see the galaxies in those halos merge. And so if, you, if you're if you looking at something that is uh, an order of magnitude bigger than our Milky Way, for example, uh, you expect it to have lots of remnants from all the stuff that it's uh, swallowed over the years, basically. So all, this, all, the, all the galaxies it acquired, all the gas that it acquired. Um, but there's a couple of things you should notice. One, all these big halos are sort of connected by these um, by these filaments, and along those filaments is also where gas funnels to these galaxies. Uh, and then also that um, uh, even the fact that they're merging doesn't mean that they're not elliptical or star forming. So uh, sorry, a spiral or star forming. You can still be a spiral galaxy and uh, survive a merger or survive a. Um, in minor merger, especially, uh, so you can uh, you can have a violent history and still be in this galaxy. So why Vera Rubin? Um, well, so she is uh, uh, one of the two people that published studies showing evidence for dark matter in uh, form of their rotation. Uh, so she uh, died in 2016, and part of the um, uh, the Twitter conversation was that wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of tribute to her. Uh, she never got the Nobel Prize, and um, honestly, I think if you ask most people who work on dark matter, uh, I'm from the University of Groningen, that is what is a big part of the, uh, the core mission there. Uh, rotation curves was something that uh, uh, Groningen did for a very long time because they have the Vesterbork radio telescope there, and so the other group was uh, situated at Groningen. So I'm intimately familiar with the whole history of like looking for rotation curves, the hunt for dark matter. 
Uh, and so uh, that was one part of it. The other part is that uh, pretty much everybody had fantastic stories about how she encouraged them as a as a um, as a junior scientist. And uh, and honestly, that is something I have one as well. I visited uh, the institute that she was working at, gave a colloquium, and uh, and the, the neat part was that she was like, oh, interesting dust, yeah. So looking for little galaxies all the way through, and then she just kind of rummaged around, found a letter by Edwin Hubble. Uh, noted that he saw a little galaxy through Andromeda. And, you know, that just was such a cool thing to, to show. And it was really encouraging. And the fun part was that uh, Piet van der Kruyt, all, my, my thesis supervisor, also had, a, had all positive stories about her. So it's, it seems to be very pervasive. So very cool person. Uh, and one of two people, one of two, you know, a key part of the two groups that uh, found this, this evidence for rotation. Um, so typically what you look at is uh, if you see a rotation curve like this, the further out you look from the, from the disk of a galaxy, the faster uh, everything rotates, which means that if you add up all the light that you see, you, you expect it to rotate much slower. Um, and uh, this was kind of found from a combination of observations. And this is kind of typically what you're shown. You're just like, oh yes, in the, close to the galaxy, you see these H alpha, these um, uh, glowing ionized hydrogen uh, clouds. And so you can trace the, the, the velocity of that from the H alpha line. And so that's what uh, Vera Rubin and uh, her supervisor Ford did. Uh, and then further out, you trace that with a 21 centimeter radio line um, out to much greater distances. And so that's kind of the, the uh, this is the, the kind of the uh, picture of the sketch that I had in my head. But of course, those points actually overlap. You can keep looking for uh, small glowy, um, glowing H alpha regions out further and further out. And that H, uh, that uh, 21 centimeter rotation goes all the way to the center. So basically these two, um, uh, observational approaches really overlapped and uh, confirmed each other. And so this is why I think everybody was expecting some permutation of the people that are named there to, to get uh, the Nobel Prize. And so this is an example. UGC 2885 was in her uh, original 1980s study um, and it was later confirmed with other uh, techniques that yes, the rotation curve is incredibly flat and it goes out to 140 kiloparsecs uh, and it Pretty much stays, you know, close to 300 kilometers a second. So this is a huge disk galaxy that just rotates and otherwise looks exactly like any other SC galaxy. It is a, um, uh, it sits on the Tully Fisher exactly on the line. It's just, it's always the point that's, you know, all the way to the right, all the way at the, at the top. But other than that, it seems to just follow all the scaling relations. The second paper she wrote in 1980 uh, kind of made it into her book. And this is how I got to know about it. Um, the one was on the rotation curves with, uh, with the uh, slit spectroscopy and, dark, and uh, dark matter. The other one just noted that UC2885 was really, really big. Um, and so this is the, uh, the one figure from that paper uh, where it shows like here's M81, there's the Milky Way, there's M51, M104, M31, Andromeda, like all these galaxies that we all know and have like a whole mosaic from, uh, from Hubble from, uh, and there's M101. These are all our favorite, you know, backyard uh, telescope uh, extragalactic targets. And of course, Hubble has taken either a full mosaic of all of them, or in the case of M31, uh, about a third, because you can't quite do the whole thing. Um, but I noticed that um, UGC 2885 hadn't been observed with Hubble at all, and that seemed like an opportunity. Um, so she noted that it, our Milky Way is about, has a diameter of about 25 kiloparsec in, this, in her paper. She noted that this galaxy is 10 times bigger. It has a radius that is 10 times bigger than our Milky Way. Um, and the mass is equally uh, much larger than uh, any of these uh, canonical disk or nearby uh, galaxies. So it's, it's a beast. It's a, it's a very large uh, disk galaxy. And so uh, that's how the project got born, to, um, to take a Hubble picture of it. Now, of course, we didn't just go in going like, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have a Hubble picture of this galaxy? Quite the opposite. We were kind of curious of how this galaxy actually became such a large disk galaxy. Uh, you can also see why nobody dared to look uh, with Hubble at this before, because there is this bright 
um, Milky Way star right in front of it. Um, and so um, it's a little scary to point uh, Hubble at uh, such a bright star, but it can be done. So um, we took a mosaic of the whole thing and we're now in the process of uh, looking over this, you know, this wealth of data. Um, and um, I, uh, I love the fact that because as soon as you have a, have a picture like this, you get uh, all these uh, neat little videos to go with it as well. So if you want to go look at it, you can actually look at it with a fairly small telescope already. Um, it's, so it's in Perseus um, and you can already sort of see it. I mean, I say it's a bright star, but of course you don't actually see it. It's just in the way. And so it's a little harder to, to do with a space telescope. Um, so it is actually uh, one of the, um, uh, I don't want to say amateur, but like the enthusiastic astronomers here in Louisville, I already took a picture of it uh, from their backyard. It's a Northern object. And so it's pretty easy to, uh, to see. Uh, and so the Hubble observations were set up so that we had a Rithic 3 mosaic and then have uh, ancillary uh, ACS fields because our goal is the globular cluster population. So we wanna look what the globular cluster population near the galaxy looks like, um, and then also see how big of a halo population of globular clusters there is, and that's what the ACS fields are for. Um, I did also, I did get a personal uh, goal out of this, which was that I finally had an astronomy picture of the day. So uh, that, was a, that was a really cool moment. Um, and of course, we had to, got to present this at the um, at the American Astronomical Society meeting. So you know, I met some of the team there. This is back in the day when we actually met people in person in a large room, um, and so it's kind of weird to look back on that. But uh, there was a big physical picture of that. So the question now is, how do you grow a big disk galaxy like that? Um, and so uh, any merger, if you have a disk leaves either uh, leaves some kind of kinematic or uh, more likely a morphological tracer. If you merge with anything uh, like a major merger, uh, you might not even have a disk at the end of it. You might end up looking like an elliptical. So or if it's even a minor merger, you expect corrugation, you expect extra spiral arms, you expect asymmetry. Uh, you can pick it up pretty quickly. And um, if there was a history of many uh, uh, mergers, we'd expect a range of ages in globular clusters. We expect to see a lot of globular clusters because globular clusters, you know, there's a certain number per stellar mass in the uh, small galaxies. And if you add, kept, keep adding small galaxies, you should see a lot of globular clusters left. So relatively, how many globular clusters are there? And I'm sort of giving it away there because we're seeing relatively few. So that implies that it hasn't been merging with a lot of, for its mass, hasn't been merging with a lot of things. Now, you may have heard of something called the super spiral. Um, it is very massive. The stellar mass uh, clocks in just over 10 to the 12. Now, that's usually not a disk galaxy. That's usually an elliptical. But it is just sitting there quietly uh, forming stars. Uh, it's nowhere near the main, uh, like it's not exactly on the main sequence. And if you go for the star forming main sequence, you should end up at a super spiral. It's just sort of sitting in the middle, um, and not being quite quiescent, not really being a full on star forming galaxy, but it's a disk and uh, it's very, very massive. The super spirals, on the other hand, are typically. Uh, mergers or post-merger galaxies. It's pretty clearly there's a secondary um, uh, nucleus, there's a uh, title of features, there's messed up arms. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence that these things are post-merger but still have a disk. So they're not, it's not a super spiral. It's a big spiral galaxy, but it's not a super spiral in the terms as like a post-merger uh, event. So they're always found in groups in denser environments. So how well, how does that fit in there? Um, so it's even bigger, but a little lower on the lower end of the star formation side. And here is the stellar mass versus effective radius. If you look at the typical studies done for um, uh, mass size relation, this galaxy always sits on any, any scaling relation for galaxies. It sits there, but you know, two orders of magnitude where everybody else is. So it seems to be just, this is what you get if you just keep feeding a, um, uh, a disk galaxy, just keep feeding it gas, that's what you end up with. Uh, is it rare? 
So um, now I looked at two masks. There's, there's a lot of galaxies of that luminosity, uh, but the uh, environmental, environmentally speaking, it seems to be, you know, its fourth nearest neighbor is still um, many, many, uh, should we say megaparsecs, now that I see that, uh, it's still several megaparsecs away. So it sits on all the galaxy scaling relations. It's massive, uh, but it's in relative isolation. So it's just a really, it's the biggest thing in the neighborhood um, uh, spiral disk. So we look for the, uh, for the globular clusters. Uh, we identified a whole bunch of young clusters and we identified uh, red and blue globular clusters. Um, and we looked at uh, if we can actually see what the, the size luminosity relation could tell us anything about the metallicities. Um, there's a range uh, visible, but it's kind of consistent with having uh, just ma it's making stars gradually over time. Uh, we looked at the luminosity function. This is the luminosity function in v, uh, v magnitude. And then we compared that to the histogram is uh, basically all the other galaxies that you saw, typical other disk galaxies. And it's closer in its absolute uh, um, a luminosity function to like M83 or M85, uh, 51 So these are the smaller disk galaxies. It looks, as far as the, uh, the global cluster luminosity function is, it looks like a small galaxy. It looks like a low mass galaxy, which is odd. So if we translate that into um, the uh, either the, so on the X axis, you can see the uh, absolute luminosity and on the Y axis is T, which is the relative frequency of globular clusters per million solar masses. Millions, yes, million solar masses. And so this is a, um, a compilation from Georgiev Jor in uh, uh, 2010. And uh, as you can see the uh, ellipticals, the, uh, the triangles are um, ellipticals and the blue dots, for example, are irregular galaxies. So irregular galaxies or dwarf ellipticals, they have relatively large numbers of globular clusters or big ellipticals, because big ellipticals have been built up from lots and lots of small galaxies. And then there is a um, uh, UC, UGC 2885, which is all the way at the bottom as if it was never built by a whole bunch of mergers, but simply, I don't know, started at the top right you know, on, the, on the bottom dotted line and simply grew over time. And it was never good at making its own global clusters and never acquired any either. So it looks like it's an extreme as if you, um, it's an extreme case. So in this case, it's, it's pretty interesting. What happens if you just leave a disk galaxy alone and you don't mess with it? You don't pick at it. And so that's the, that makes this galaxy interesting because it's the biggest disk we know of in the local universe and the local universe, uh, meaning that anything where I can actually resolve a globular cluster. Um, <clears throat> and it's the biggest disk uh, that we know of. And it's an SC galaxy, it has a tiny little bulge. So that was our first result. It's relatively isolated. It looks like it's globular cluster population supports the scenario where it's a gradually grown giant disk galaxy. So that's our, that was our first result. That was our main science goal. Um, however, uh, not leaving well enough alone, uh, we're kind of curious if this is indeed a galaxy that grew over time uh, and it's forming stars all the way out to the way you can see, basically the, the, the width of the, um, of the mosaic, uh, there is star formation going on all the way out. Um, and it seems to be this, giant disk, but there is a little bit of a bulge there. Um, can't quite make out if that's a bar or not, but um, is, is there a, uh, a supermassive black hole? Because anything that's 10 to the 12 uh, solar masses in uh, stellar mass, honestly, in our experience, that should have a big uh, supermassive black hole to go with it. Is there, right? So and how, how, uh, how good can I tell if there's anything going on there in the center and how big is that uh, supermassive black hole? So uh, first thing you go do is go look at, at, uh, at uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, if you can see, um, if you can get its spectra and then you know, get, uh, the, put it on the BPT diagram, right? That's the first step you do if you're looking for AGN. Uh, unfortunately, this is where the um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey ends. 
So that was a bit, uh, bit of a disappointment. Um, if really they had only gone one tile further, I would have been fine. But uh, nope, there was no spectrum. Uh, so you go look for the wise colors and see if you, if you can identify if there's an AGM going on there in the center. Uh, the, um, the contours is where all the wise uh, galaxies uh, are. Uh, are. Uh, and so we identify the foreground star. The foreground star is definitely off and the nucleus is well, nowhere near where you would put an AGN, really. Um, and so I, uh, I kind of moped about that for, for a bit. Um, and I did that on Twitter, of course. So um, that's when uh, Josh Peak and John Wu uh, came to the rescue, especially John Wu, who's an uh, expert in machine learning. He um, had been doing this particular project where he took SDSS spectra, ran them through a VAA encoder. So essentially turning them into a couple of numbers, uh, which you can then use as um, a label space for the features that are the input images from the PanStar uh, survey. So he ran both of these. He converted all the spectra into, um, into uh, the labels, and then he trained a uh, convolutional neural network or the hybrid neural network, hybrid neural network to predict spectra, which I think is, is still, to me, still feels a little bit like, um, what is going on here? How, how good can this be, right? Um, because the input images, there's, uh, the, these are the PanStar images, Y through uh, U, uh, and so they, uh, it's multicolor images, uh, but they're a little postage stamp and it's going to predict like, so that's five bits of information. They're all images. So there's a little bit more information and that's going to predict the, uh, the spectrum. And the fact that you can, could predict the whole spectrum was just a little mind blowing to me anyway. Um, so uh, there's a large, of course, a large training set available from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And so he ran through this um, and uh, it's simply something that can take anything that's in pan stars, any nearby, well, relatively nearby galaxy and then predict the spectrum and do really well. So this is Rubens Galaxy's nuclear spectrum as predicted by a machine. Uh, and there's a couple of ones to, to compare against. There's a star forming galaxy, big whopping emission lines, AGN, widening and, and some me intermediate uh, emission lines, that's the green spectrum, and a quiescence uh, galaxy like an elliptical that only has absorption lines. So there is something like the prediction is something in between. It's like it's got a little bit AGN, it's mostly quiescent, that's what I'm expecting. So that's what the machine learning algorithm says, this is what I'm expecting. But remember, this was a rare and kind of strange galaxy, right? It's, it's um, it's supposed to, it's 10 times bigger than the Milky Way. The Milky Way is the typical spiral that you should expect. Uh, it's, sorry, 10 times wider than the Milky Way. It's about a hundred times more massive. So it's sitting all the way off from all the normal, um, all the normal galaxies. So how, how reliable is this spectrum? So this felt like a good uh, edge case, right? So this feels like a, well, it should probably break here. This is something where it, doesn't occur a lot in, and doesn't occur in our training sample. Is we shouldn't be seeing that many of them. So let's see how we do. So let's check. Um, and so uh, what we then did was uh, dig out spectra from, from, from the long, long, long ago. Uh, thank you, Bill Keel, who had one still on a scan, on like a paper scan. Anyway, we kind of converted that to a spectra. We asked various people nicely if they still had a spectrum of this galaxy. And uh, we got some new observations uh, on the multi-mirror telescope. Uh, and so they're all done at various apertures, as you can see here. So we got a KPNO spectrum. The 60 inch was uh, from 1983. The virus P was part of a, an IFU observation by uh, Jason Young. And, uh, and then the MMT uh, by Joanna Hinz and Tim Pickering. Uh, and so we had a, have a bunch of spectra that we can now compare one-on-one -on -one to the machine learning prediction. And that's what, um, <clears throat> what I'm showing you here, the 60 inch from the 1980s um, and the virus P don't have full coverage, but uh, we can see that, and the KPNO is, is so noisy that I'm not really sure about any of the emission lines. So that's some of the older spectra. But even the older spectra seem to agree nicely with our machine learning prediction from an SCSS spectrum. The virus P seems to agree on the blue side and the KMMT uh, observations seem to you know, agree uh, mostly on the, uh, on the entirety of the thing, except that they're really from the nucleus and you can see that the emission lines uh, pop up a bit more. Uh, 
So um, four different observations and they all agree quite nicely with our machine learning prediction. So I think this is like a real uh, winner for, um, uh, for machine learning. I didn't think it would be, it could take a bunch of images and go, here's your spectrum. That, yeah, that's pretty amazing to me. Um, and so we looked at where it ended up, where UGC 2885, Rubens Galaxy, ended up where its nucleus should lie on its on the parameter space that uh, the training happened on. And so it's kind of hanging out near passive galaxies uh, or no, not even in, in the cloud of SDSS training. So um, it did a good job predicting something that it really hadn't seen much of before. So I think John Wu is quite excited about this because he's uh, now wants to figure out how from this um, we got we got this edge case to work anyway. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, we also looked at the BPT diagram. So both the machine learning predicted one and the one that we got from the MT nucleus are so right in the center. So that that moved all the all the uh, line strengths up a bit. Uh, but uh, even from the observed uh, uh, KPNO and the ML uh, machine learning one, they both classify it as an AGN and not no longer as a passive galaxy. So it's pretty neat that this, this actually seems to uh, seems to work. Um, so that's uh, that's coming to an ABJ letter near you. Um, <clears throat> and so Rubens Galaxy, big massive disk. Um, still star forming galaxy. So how does it build all this stuff at this rate? So one of the next things for us to do is figure out its star formation history. This is what Jason Young is, uh, is, is looking at because um, if it was building this every, you know, 0.4 of a, um, uh, 0.4 of a, uh, a solar mass a year, like is the age of the universe enough to get all the way there? Um, and so uh, how, what kind of star formation history are we looking at? So that's uh, one of the next things that we want to look at. The stellar cluster population seems to strongly imply that there wasn't any merger activity. Uh, and so this is quite typical of a slow buildup. We think this is a gentle giant and uh, you know, didn't, uh, didn't need anything. Um, and the nucleus holds an AGN. Well, that wasn't that surprising, but it is remarkably well predicted by the machine algorithm by Wu and Peak. Uh, and, um, uh, since these big disks are quite rare, it was kind of neat to see that the machine, le machine learning algorithm got it right anyway. Uh, and so uh, this might be a lovely laboratory. What happens if you put an AGN in the middle of a giant disk and you don't disturb it? So how big is the black hole in the center? Uh, how, sits that, how sits that on all the scaling relations? Because it has a tiny bulge, probably something grown you know, secularly. Uh, and so how do you feed like this AGN is just, just uh, a secular uh, uh, processes, but how do you get it to, um, <clears throat> how do you feed it, right? And, and since this is a um, massive disk, so everything is scaled up, but without any uh, inter, uh, without an interaction history, uh, it's it might be an excellent uh, place to go and uh, uh, and check secular processes for uh, feeding AGN. Really, any uh, disk process that you're interested in, because it seems like this is just uh, a disk on steroids, but uh, without any uh, outside interference. So a pretty neat laboratory for a single galaxy. Again, I usually study you know, millions of galaxies. So having a single galaxy uh, project was kind of really neat. Uh, and I would like to thank all my collaborators who did wonderful work. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, my students who helped me with uh, finding um, literature about this, this galaxy and uh, helping me out uh, um, with, with basically all aspects of this project it was really neat, uh, really fun to do. So, um, of course, we never stop there. We're obs observational astronomers. So uh, we got some IRM time to look for the, new, uh, the gas reservoir for this galaxy. And uh, we're looking at uh, CITEL, which is a really neat uh, IFU uh, uh, instrument on the uh, uh, CFHT to, uh, to observe the um, uh, the kinematics and the and the chemistry of this, uh, this the whole disk of this galaxy, uh, and then we hope to get Keck and Jada was tea time to look closer at the center, but that you know later. So that's one half is uh, is we got, and the other half is uh, is uh, something that we're hoping to get. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, for listening, and um, I'll uh, I'll take questions. Everybody's been really quiet, so.
Thanks, Penny. All right, I have I have a, a few quick questions, and then uh, I will uh, have the audience uh, to uh, raise their hands. Uh, so my first question is: um, uh, So, what what is the uh, predicted uh, 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 size of the uh, sphere for inference for this black hole at the center of this galaxy? So we don't we don't know its mass because we only have the spectra right now. They're not even particularly high resolution spectra. Uh, so we just have uh, equivalent widths. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to get an IFU on this. Uh, that's what I've been proposing for to, um, to see if we can get the mass for this nucleus. Uh, as you can see, there is still dust like that. that uh, this blow up has the, uh, has the dust lanes from, um, from the Hubble picture. So you probably have to go to the infrared. So that's why I put Keck mm -hmm. and uh, James Wett there. Um, because I'd like to get um, kinematics for this very, like that central region. Uh, that central region has a nuclear star cluster. And honestly, I think there's barely any bulge. There might be a little bit. I haven't seen a proper decomposition yet. And so that's on the, on the docket as well. Um, with Spitzer, that's going to be a little tricky. Um, we have Spitzer images for this, but uh, I think we're looking at uh, trying to do a decomposition of the Hubble picture, so that should be uh, interesting. Uh, and so we can see how much of a bulge there is, but honestly, I think it's mostly a nuclear star cluster with its um, AGN. So something's going on there. Uh, I just don't know what the mass for this uh, supermassive black hole is. If you look at the scaling relations, it should be uh, it should be pretty big, like a few million um, cell masses. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, but but it's bulge. Uh, the the bulge is quite small, so uh, it's hard to hard, it's hard to say. Uh, if you use a total stellar mass black hole mass relation, then it will probably give you a pretty big big black hole mass. Um, um, and this galaxy is not not very very far away, so you know, it's, it might be possible to resolve it resolve the sphere of inference to get the uh, dynamical black hole mass measurement. That's what I was hoping. Uh, there's no, um, I don't think there's any good X-ray on this galaxy either. I don't think anybody expected much of an X-ray source. It's fairly low surface brightness. Um, I mean, it's not male in one or anything like that, it's, but it's, it's, it's still a, a normal spiral galaxy. Uh, it's too bright to be a low surface brightness. It's too big to be a normal spiral. It is too unperturbed to be really a, uh, uh, to be a super spiral. So it is um, just a normal disk, which is kind of strange for what it is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it'd be really cool to, to look at the center of this. Right. Um, so you do our, have HST resolved uh, multiband photometry? Yes, uh, we yeah. have. I was uh, wondering if you, you can do a reconstruction of the uh, star formation history uh, and see if it uh, 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 consistent with uh, uh, the idea that they just uh, kind of regularly build up uh, its stellar mass without mergers over the cosmic time. So this is something that we hope to do with both the HST images and then um, the virus B is a uh, IFU, so it has a, an H an H alpha uh, map of this oh. much coarser, of course, but <clears throat> we've done a um, star formation history of the center, uh, which is, I think, you know, consistent with a burst at 10 billion years ago. I'm doing this from memory. Um, but everything else is fairly young, but very steadily uh, uh, burning through gas. Not particularly, um, it's not bursty. That's that's what's noticeable. Mm -hmm. You sort of, if you look at this, you can see that there's, uh, there's lots of little blue dots here and there, but there's no, and there's some that are a little bit, you know, closer together, but there is no, it's, it's, it's all over. It's not like concentrated particularly in the spiral arms or particularly, uh, it's, it's fairly spread out. So it's actual, it's star formation surface, uh, uh, surface density of star formation is actually fairly low, uh, but it's throughout a 250 color parsec or, you know, so that order disc. So it actually does add up. Um, and so we're kind of curious what the uh, molecular, uh, uh, you can see plenty of dust in here. You can see plenty of uh, um, uh, likely molecular gas. So we're kind of curious how that looks. 
uh, and then you compare that to the, to the star formation history. That is what Jason Young is, uh, is interested. Uh, the CTEL observation should help with that as well because then we get some metallicity mm -hmm. constraint on top of that. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So we have a, a few questions from the audience. So Brian. Yeah, so thanks for your talk. And, and that, 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 that image is the one I was gonna ask about. So, uh, um, uh, on the sort of upper right, there's this uh, lenticular looking thing. I assume that that's not, that they're not talking to each other. That's just a superposition. Yeah, that's nowhere near. Um, it's very hard to actually estimate how far away this is um, because I don't think it's in two mass, uh, but um, you can look at uh, surface brightness fluctuations. And um, while here you can actually see, you know, you can see the, the individual O's almost individual uh, star clusters. This is incredibly smooth. I, was, I got excited about that because it has, um, it has clearly has some dusty structures in front of it. And I'm not entirely convinced that that belongs to that elliptical, but I think that elliptical is much further away and that might actually be dust that's belonging to the spiral structure for the whole, the galaxy as a whole. So oh. there might still be, yeah, there might still be molecular gas all the way out there. Uh, but that, that's very much a distant galaxy, so background right. object. Right, right. I assume so. But so then, but uh, along those lines, though, uh, to my to my untrained eye, I don't see any little dwarf galaxies, little satellites around it. So, so do you do you, you found any? What's, no. what's the story with sort of substructure? There is nothing going on. We we sort of stared at it a while, and there's like these little faint blue stuff that you can see, but they're pretty clearly in these spiral arms and these spiral arms are very symmetric. It has effectively four arms. It has these big ones that you can see going um, uh, left and right. And then at the top and the bottom, you can sort of see the, um, this, the secondary uh, arm. So it has a, it's a four arm spiral. It has a large gas reservoir. It is rotating at a maximum of 350 kilometers a second, which is, I think, the biggest disk there is. Um, and, um, but all, it sits on all the scaling relations. It's exactly what you expect. It's a model disk galaxy. Uh, it's just really huge. We also are just, and it was a kind of sort of um, forgotten about for 40 years, because this, uh, this paper came out, but of course, all the attention went to the other one. Um, and Bill uh, had a look through the, uh, the, uh, the history of like what, what's the record holder for the biggest normal galaxy. And so Malin 1 is usually pointed out as the biggest disk galaxy, but it is a low surface brightness. This doesn't even qualify as a low surface brightness. It's, it's just a disk galaxy. So yeah, it's very strange. It, it should have some other stuff around it. I'm hoping to get some um, to interest the, um, the dragonfly people. Uh, enough so that they can look and see if there's any like faint streamers or anything like that around, but I, I'm not expecting any. And so if you tell them that, then you're like, well, if you're not looking for, if you're looking for them, but you don't expect them, then uh, maybe later. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, uh, Gosson? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to apologize in advance, but I have comment and two questions, but I hope they'll all be useful. Um, so the comment is you were talking about getting a black hole mass for this thing uh, and you have its AGN activity and you were just at the start of the colloquium where we gave a poster uh, called AGN Net, an award for using machine learning to get black hole masses from AGN light curves. So <laughs> yeah, I know, like maybe you folks should uh, email each other after this, this talk. That was the comment. Uh, Absolutely. On the, uh, on the machine learning question uh, side. So it's, it's not all that surprising to me that you guys can get a good SED. After all, in some sense, all the deep learning is doing is a convolution. Uh, to get an integrated flux, and then you're doing a CD fitting for all practical purposes, which people have done in other methods. What I really am curious to see, though, since this is a little bit different from all the other galaxies out there, um, is from a large sample, if you can apply this method and then just use the same sort of diagnostics to get photosies out of the, the, the SED or uh, fake redshifts out of the SEDs, how well do they compare to other SED fitting codes that get photosies? Uh, this is sort of relevant for LSST in particular, and I'm I'm curious about this because these VAEs can handle missing data a lot better than sort of more typical methods that you know need every single band to always be observed. 
Yeah, so uh, that's a question definitely for John Wu and not me. Um, I am the simple observer in this, uh, this scenario and not the machine learning person. Um, however, so I was impressed because the level of detail, like the absorption features it got right and the level of detail it got right on the, uh, the mission lines, uh, if you just, it, 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 it's, uh, this, this, uh, this unfolded exactly like I said, like it's not like I asked John Wu to hold the envelope closed until I actually took the observation. It's literally, he gave me this mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I guess this is the spectra until I find something better, at which point, you know, we looked at these, like we got the spectra to go look for them. Um, so that is a level of detail. An SED, I could have believed an SED, like a photo Z or an, uh, a Stellar Mass, et cetera, that, that I can believe. Actually spitting out a full on spectra is, yeah. a, it's like, where does it get its information from, really? All I mean, the other SDSS galaxies, apparently. Well, yeah, but um, so here's the, here's the thing that we were, um, here's the thing that I worry about, right? It's um, look, so the uh, SDSS spectra is com comparable to the 60 inch. Mm -hmm. So this is like a tiny little uh, spectra on the nuclear region. Yep. Look how much disk I still got left, right? Yep. It somehow looked at the rest of the disk and said, here's your spectra for the nucleus. Yep. Uh, and uh, it trained, meanwhile, on things that are further away. So I'm kind of going like, okay, maybe there's some of these bigger disks snuck in, but that means that the nuclear part is, uh, sorry, the spectrum is suddenly no longer covering just the nucleus. Yes. It's covering like that and the bar and the first part of the star, star forming disk, right? So there's some yeah. kind of other mix in there. So uh, the aperture dilution that we were expecting here, or so it, this does not suffer from aperture dilution. Meanwhile, the training set did have aperture mm -hmm. dilution. How did it get there? Uh, so that, that's the part that we've, me and John have been, you know, going yeah. back and forth on. Um, it's one galaxy, I realize that, but it's a weird one. Yeah. And, and it got it right, which yeah. is cool. Um, so yeah, I'm very curious. Uh, it, I, I suspect that this can do, um, photo Z's, as you said, a lot better than, um, it, it, pro it might actually do photo Z's a lot better. If it can predict the spectrum, then it can pred yeah. predict how far it was redshifted, so. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see, especially if it can handle the outliers, uh, which is where a lot of the photo Z methods fail. Uh, and anyway, last, last quick question. Um, so this thing is accreting gas relatively slowly. There doesn't seem to be very much to disrupt that gas. So you expect a bunch of star formation, presumably, right? Yep. And so you should also expect a whole bunch of coconut supernovae, right? You tell me you're the supernova. I mean, <laughs> I, I would have thought you would have seen a, a whole bunch of coconut supernova. And this thing does show up in uh, my grad student's database, but it's apparently only had the one uh, 2002F in its entire history that we know of. And so I, I was kind of curious that. if you have any kind of like narrowband imaging and you can find uh, remnants for supernova in this galaxy. Why are we getting the CITEL and the uh, IFU? Of course we are to do that, right? So um, one of the, uh, I don't know, I think there's been a bit of a shift. It's okay now to mess with the IMF. Um, and, uh, and that might be what's happening in the outskirts here. You should ask Jason Young for that because that's, yeah. this is his interest. But um, you can see that there is star formation. There are O stars all the way out to, you know, yeah. hundreds of kiloparsecs on either side. Our Milky Way fits in that orange circle. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there is definitely star formation going on, yeah. but it might be stochastic or localized enough that it doesn't, it never seems to make enough for enough supernova. Yeah. So, so actually Brian messaged me on the side and said the star formation date is apparently anemic in the part and it's like to like 0.4 solar masses a year, which is really surprising because then what is all this gas just doing? <laughs> And that's why we got the RM data because we're like, what, why, where is it? Because it's there. Uh, it's just really slowly okay. making its own stars, but very slowly. But it must have been either much more active in the in the past because otherwise you don't get to ten to the twelve solar masses. Yeah, yeah, it'd really be cool to see that open imaging of this thing soon. Cool.
Thanks, Benny. Thank you. Yeah, awesome questions. Thank you. All right, so the next question is uh, from Tony. Yeah, Benny, um, I'm curious because this is maybe a nice example where there's been relatively little radial mixing of material. And so it would be quite interesting to know how the uh, H2 reg region metallicities look, uh, if there's a clear metallicity gradient and uh, uh, what, whether that's been characterized. Uh, what, what do you know about that? Uh, nothing just yet, um, because we have, uh, so CTEL is a fantastic instrument uh, <clears throat> on the CFHT and it has taken the data. Um, we have an H alpha map from um, uh, the virus P instrument and we're looking at, um, let's see if I got this right, uh, the uh, silicon, the nitrogen and the oxygen lines. Uh, so we're trying to make a, a, a narrow band image of the, of the galaxy from the CTEL uh, data. Uh, CTEL data comes with a bit of a, a learning curve. So, um, and we just got the data. So it is, it's a work in progress, but that's, uh, that's definitely follow up. Trying to figure out uh, what the stellar populations of this disk are made of, how that, uh, how, how it's doing its star formation. I mean, the, the H alpha map has been known for a while uh, and that's, that's what gives that 0.4 solar mass per square kiloparsec out to all the way, uh, but uh, it's uh, it'll be really interesting to see how much uh, radial mis mixing, as you said, there might be a bar in this center, but I mean, I have to squint every time to see it. Um, uh, and then other than that, it just seems to be uh, um, just a gradually growing disk. And is that star formation rate corrected for extinction? Because it, it does seem there's quite a bit of dust visible in this image. Uh, I know they corrected it uh, using the Balmer decrement. Uh, Hunter et al. did that in 2013, but um, I'm curious to see if uh, if we can find some some other tracers. It would be lovely if. Um, trouble is that as soon as I try to do this with Wise or anything like that, that whopper of a star starts, you know, starts messing with us. So uh, there's a reason that uh, uh, this wasn't on everybody's top list because uh, that star really messes with your data. Um, but there, there you are. It's a really interesting galaxy anyway. That's pretty. She really uh, drew me to it. Understood, thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, I still see Gawson's hands. Uh, uh, actually, I've seen uh, Brian's hands is also up. Uh, Brian, do you have a, uh, another question? Yeah, I mean, if people need to go, you don't have to stick around for all my questions. But oh, yeah, just ahead. one last thing that occurs to me, you, you, look, you said you look for um, globular clusters sort of uh, out, uh, above and below the plane at some, what looked to me like at a pretty impressive distance. Did you find any? Um, yeah, that work is still in progress. Uh, let's see if I can find the plot real quick. Here we go. I have the globular cluster population for the for the mosaic. The mosaic is the thing that we ended up uh, uh, focusing on because I wanted to get the pretty picture, or SCSE, I wanted to get the pretty picture as soon as humanly possible. So that's what I worked on. Uh, but the uh, both the ACS fields, which are, if I have to eyeball this now, um, they're about the megaparsec on either side. So yeah, there, no, that's too much. Um, we're about 50 kiloparsecs. Yeah, uh, above and below the plane. That's why I pointed, uh, it, was, it was quite a bit of a maneuvering to, to get um, continuous fields above and below the plane. Uh, they rather have them, um, you know, circled all the way around, but I was interested in seeing uh, if we can actually see any uh, halo globular clusters. Uh, global clusters should still be there, not a lot, but that's why I wanted a continuous field. I haven't found much yet. Ah, uh, so. okay. Because I think if you got them, I don't know if you could do a rotation curve kind of thing, but outside of the plane. Uh. Um, woof. Um, yeah, but then I would have to have a, um, a emission line or a narrowband. Yeah, uh, observation of that. Yeah, no, I, I like the idea, absolutely. But uh, no, we were just looking for, um, for actually identifying and coming up with a clean cluster sample because um, if you try to do this with Spitzer, for example, uh, they, they mix in with the background. Um, it's, there's, there's no way you can do it you, from the ground is even very hard. Uh, so if you really want to distinguish globular clusters from all the little background galaxies, then uh, you definitely want uh, 
on Hubble because well, you can see all the little background galaxies. There are so many of them. Uh, and then so, and then there's, um, I mean, a fair number of, uh, um, uh, there's a fair number of uh, foreground stars as well. So uh, identifying the uh, global clusters was actually pretty tricky. So having the colors is good. Thanks. All right. Okay, uh, Tony. Uh, you, your hand is still up, so you have uh, another question. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so any more like questions question. from the audience? Okay, looks like we're all good. Uh, I think uh, the lesson we learned here is that uh, even a single galaxy can be quite interesting. And I'm still surprised that uh, nobody else has looked at paid attention to this uh, one of the biggest spiral galaxies in the in the nearby universe. It's uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, until you uh, uh, you uh, came along with uh, with uh, these uh, studies. So let's thank Dr. Uh, Albert for uh, the talk uh, and give him uh, another round of virtual applause. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Okay, thanks. Uh, and with that, we will uh, conclude this uh, semester's uh, uh, astrocrogram series. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, have a nice summer. <laughs>